This is Dan, and this is the Napkin Academy. Today's lesson is going to be about visual thinking process step number two, seeing, otherwise known as pattern recognition and the blank ways we see, the six, the six ways that we see. That's how many we're going to find that there are. So the way I want to think about this, let's, let's put ourselves in a little allegorical situation and let's imagine that we are a happy little deer and we're standing by the side of the road happily crunching on, I don't know, whatever it is that deer eat. And all of a sudden, along the road, comes this noisy, flashing, loud, roaring, tearing thing coming right at us. What do we do? We panic. Duh! We become the deer in the headlights and we get mowed down. The issue is we can't solve a problem that over overwhelms our senses. We can't solve a problem that overwhelms us. We become like the deer in the headlights when we see a big scary problem coming at us and that's what we don't want to have happen. And what we need to learn to do is to be able to very quickly see, recognize the patterns of what is coming at us so that it doesn't knock us down. You know, we don't have to be a deer to imagine how this works. I don't know if, if any, I don't know if you've ever uh, purchased something from Ikea. You know, it's wonderful. Ikea has all these great uh, modular pieces of furniture and you go into the huge uh, Ikea mega store and inside they have a showroom where they have lots of assembled pieces. It's Ikea. And they have lots of boxes in the, on the bottom floor they have, is where they have all the boxes. And what you do is you go into the top floor and you see what you want to buy and then you move to the bottom floor and that's where they have all these boxes stacked up and so you were up on the showroom and you saw this beautiful shelf you know let's say you saw a shelf that looks something like this it's got a, it's a cabinet is what it is it's got two doors on the bottom and then it's got a couple of shelves up here and you really like that and you can imagine that very very well sitting in your bedroom you think that's what I want so you go into Ikea and you go and you buy the box and you're very, very happy because you're looking at that lovely picture on the box and you are perfectly well imagining how lovely that thing is going to look in your bedroom. And then what happens? And then you open the box and what do you see? <gasps> you see a bunch of pieces. You see a bunch of things that are undifferentiated, that are just in a big pile. You know, and there's there's some big pieces, and there's some little pieces, and there's some metal railing, and then there's this bag that's full of all kinds of funny little nuts and bolts, and then there's this crazy little wrench thing, and usually there's some other kind of a tool. And you're thinking, wait a minute. I'm not happy about this. I'm overwhelmed. This is not what I had expected. I'm not seeing here what I had wanted to. And I hope you're getting the parallel along with this, that this is exactly what happens with most business problems. We begin with an idea of what we think we're facing, and we begin with an idea of what we think a solution is going to look like. But then we start drilling down into all of the pieces, into the finances, and into the people, and into the change management and into the marketing issues and the manufacturing issues and you know it, name it and before long what we had thought was a pretty clear and straightforward problem now looks something like this well back to our IKEA, I, IKEA analogy what is the first thing that we can actually do well you know what I do and this is exactly what I'm going to recommend we do for all problem solving is I don't let that thing overwhelm me. I do not become the deer in the headlights. What I do is I look for the patterns among those pieces and I do that by sorting and I do that by clumping and what I'm doing is I'm trying to recognize recognize the pieces and the shapes 
and what do they have in common so that I can stack them up and I can say well over here I'm going to put all of my big pieces and over here I'm going to stack all of the smaller pieces and over here I'm going to put all of those railing things and over here I'm going to put all those angly things and then I'm going to take and lay out here's all the little screws and here are all the little bolts and here's the little tool and all of the sudden once again I'm feeling happy I have not solved the problem I haven't yet built the cabinet the cabinet still remains a bit of a dream but now at least based on the pieces that I'm seeing I can imagine how I'm going to build that cabinet alright that's a little bit theoretical maybe a little bit metaphysical but the reality of it is that the way we make our way through the world and do not become overwhelmed like that deer in the headlights is that we are exceptionally good as people at pattern recognition we are the best at recognizing patterns that's why so much of our visual processing has been dedicated to vision I mean let's face it the pattern recognition could be pretty simple I could see that I'm looking at stripes or I can look at something else and see that I'm looking at a plaid or I can look at something else and I can see that I'm looking at spots and my mind is going to be able to do different things with recognizing those different kinds of patterns part of the reason that my, I'm so good at pattern recognition is because our vision system has evolved over millions and millions of years to allow us to effectively see the world around us now the reality for us is that our world is three-dimensional so if I was to try to represent schematically the space in which we live it would look like a three-dimensional box and we know at all times as long as our eyes are open where we are standing within that box and the reason that we can do that is because our vision system has evolved to follow and understand a particular coordinate system and if you don't remember what a coordinate system is go back and look at the lesson on looking looking part number two we'll talk all about coordinate systems and why they're so important well here we're getting into the meat of it the reason it's important is the reason I'm, I don't fall down the moment I walk into a room the reason I don't become a deer in the headlights as I shift from one environment to the other is because we have a coordinate system that our visual system our visual thinking system recognizes our eyes recognize all the time that vision system recognizes up and down and left and right and frontwards and backwards and thousands and thousands of times a second our eyes are tracking up down left right because we understand that the world in which we live can be mapped out into a very simple x y z three dimensional coordinate system which our vision system understands and we can look at a picture or we can look at the world and we can know where we stand within it and where everything is relative to us well that's fine if we're looking at an IKEA cabinet that's fine if we're looking at a three-dimensional space that's fine if we're looking at a couple of squares and wheels that make up a car but what happens if we're looking at an idea how can we possibly try to come up with a pictorial representation of something that's as complex as an idea or a problem when it doesn't fall into some sort of 3d coordinate system what do we do what coordinate system can we possibly find to help us gear ourselves position ourselves and recognize where we are within that and how all of the pieces are going to fit together we have such a coordinate system 
and it becomes the essence of seeing. It is a six-dimensional coordinate system. Now, before you go and think that I've just gone off the, into La La Land and I'm going to start talking about string theory and the 17-dimensionality of multi-linear space, rest assured, this six-dimensional coordinate system is boneheadedly simple. And it is also true. What is it? We already know it. Instead of a three-dimensional coordinate system for solving problems, we're going to come up with a six-dimensional coordinate system that allows us to see any problem and understand what it is that we are seeing. And those six dimensions are, they're not up and down and left and right. There's something a little more conceptual and yet intuitive. They are who and what. They are how much. Coordinate number three is where. Coordinate number four is when. Coordinate number five is how. And coordinate number six is why. Very conceptual, but bear with me for a moment because this is going to help us tremendously. What I mean by this is when we look at a big, scary, hairy problem, the way our vision system has evolved to understand that, believe it or not, is to break that problem up into six different discrete types of visual information which map directly to who and what, who are the players, what are the pieces, how much, how many of them are there, are there lots of them or are there few of them, where are they in relation to each other, are they above, are they below, to the left or the right, when do they interact, which one comes first, which one comes second, and which one comes third? How do they interact? Does one cause something else, or does it cause something else? And lastly, why are they the way they are? What is the underlying coordinate system that brings all of them together so that I can understand the causes and the relationships and the underlying why between all the things that I've just seen? This is going to become the basis, this six-dimensional coordinate system is going to become the basis of the most important tool that we're going to use, which is going to be called the six by six rule. And let's go ahead and make this real for a moment, and then we'll move in to what is really going on with the six by six rule. 